Welcome to Tinoc Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of a Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament with Rabbi Michael Skoback tonight, Ephesians chapter 2, and presenting to you now, coming from his own little holy territory, Mr. Rabbi Michael Skoback. <laughs> Welcome back, sir. How are you doing tonight? Baruch Hashem. Glad to hear that you're feeling a little bit better. Yes, I am feeling a lot better. Not out of the woods yet, but uh, I enjoy the woods. No, that didn't work. Never mind. Forget what I just said. So, <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's it's getting better. Better than last last year, believe it or not. I had, uh, whenever I got this whole flu, fluish thing that happened, it, it literally had me down for almost six weeks and I almost got pneumonia. That's how bad it was. This year, it's only been a week, and I'm already getting better, Baruch Hashem. That's, that's a good sign. So uh, just a matter of time, and I'll be back full full throttle. But fortunately, Baruch Hashem, we're, we're still moving forward with the studio and with the shows. And so it's, it takes a lot more, um, you know, people who actually have gotten the flu and have that chest congestion will, will know that exercise or overexposure to physical activity will actually really aggravate that a lot. Fortunately, sitting in a chair... Not so much. So as long as I'm not coughing my head off throughout the show, I'm willing to go for it if you guys are willing to listen to it. So that's how that works. Well, you, you got lots of prayers coming your way. Thank you. Thank you, sweet Rebbe. I appreciate that very much. And so uh, tonight we're, we're coming into Ephesians chapter 2. And, uh, you know, there were several titles you chose. And, and the one I, I, I loved all of them. And, you know, you and I had a discussion about how YouTube flags certain things. And so uh, um, as much as I would like to use the more colorful titles I've, for the sake of, you know, not being flagged, I have to kind of tone it down, too. So um, but all, all of the titles you gave were were very much appropriate for tonight's show. So um, we'll move forward and I'll follow you along as usual, as possible, as quick as possible. And um, we'll just see what this thing heads off. So I appreciate you guys patience. Thank you for uh, not uh, you know getting too crazy for us starting for me starting late. We had a few technical issues on my end. Uh, my knee has a problem with reaching the power button at the perfect height on my computer and I shut it down right as we were going and uh, yeah so Rabbi Skoback and I have made plans on how to reconfigure my office I'll just say that (laughs) okay Rabbi it's all yours thank you thank you guys okay so uh, Ephesians chapter 2 I have to say that as I was going through it and through especially through the Christian commentaries I, I often felt like pulling the few hairs on my head off of my head. Um, it, it really, uh, I found some of this like very provocative. Um, and there's a lot to go through tonight, so let's, let's get started. He, he begins this chapter, Paul begins by, he's speaking obviously that the audience or is, is are the Ephesians, um, but you'll see again that everything he speaks about applies to both the, these non-Jews and the Jewish people. And he says to the Ephesians that you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You basically, you were spiritually dead. And this is really how all the Christian commentaries understand what Paul is saying. I'll just share uh, a few. The ESV study Bible says, human beings as sons and daughters of Adam enter the world spiritually dead. They have no inclination or responsiveness toward God and no ability to please God. That's basically what they understand Paul to be saying, that human beings have no inclination or responsiveness toward God. The Reformation Study Bible says all humans are in active rebellion against God. That's our default state of being. That's our default state. All human beings are in active, not inactive, but are in active rebellion against God. And then the N, the HCSB study Bible says that apart from the Messiah, people are without authentic spiritual life. This is more or less the message that comes through in all of the commentaries that I've seen. Um, and part of this, again, we go back to what we mentioned last time we met, which is this idea that somehow because Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, that literally destroys all of their progeny, all of their descendants are spiritual train wrecks. 
um, as these commentaries assert. And again, the problem we saw was that there is absolutely no mention of this pernicious doctrine of original sin in Genesis chapter 3, where the story takes place, or anywhere else in the entire Bible. The, the Bible simply never says, never mentions or hints at this idea that after Adam and Eve, all human beings are essentially spiritually dead. Um, when we study the chapter in Genesis chapter 3, there's no mention there of any eternal spiritual curse or stain on the descendants of Adam and Eve, and the idea that they inherit the sin of Adam and Eve. Again, the Bible never says this anywhere or hints at it anywhere. Um, you know, to say, as these commentaries claim, that apart from the Messiah, people are without authentic spiritual life is one of the most absurd assertions imaginable. Um, I have difficulty understanding how anyone could even think about something like that um, with a clear mind. I mean, it seems to be implying that um, saintly and godly people like Hanoch, in English he's called Enoch, but Hanoch in the beginning of the Bible, people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Moses is called a man of God throughout the Bible, Joshua, Samuel, great women like Ruth and Miriam and Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah, great prophets like Elijah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and someone like David, where God says in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, that he's a man after my heart. That's how David is described, as a man after God's heart. So how is it possible for anyone to say or to write or to believe that without believing in Jesus, people cannot have any kind of authentic spiritual life? How could anyone say that after Adam and Eve, all human beings are in rebellion against God and they have literally no spiritual inclination or responsiveness to God. I mean, it's just the most patently absurd um, and, and I think a horrible uh, concept to, to put forward. Um, but again, that's how virtually all Christian commentaries understand uh, Paul's kickoff here in Ephesians chapter 2. And he goes on to say that um, to the Ephesians who now have come to faith in Jesus, he says, you once walked following the course of this world, meaning that you basically used to be in that boat, Paul says to them. And he says, you were following the prince of the power of the air, which again, all Christian commentaries understand to be refer reference to Satan to Satan. And so what Paul says is that prior to their uh, embrace of Jesus, all of these Ephesians were like everyone else in the world, basically under the um, thumb and following the, the lead of Satan. Um, this again is um, a, a constant refrain in the Christian Bible, that one of the effects of the sin of Adam and Eve is that all human beings are under the control of Satan. Satan, as the Gospels say, is the ruler of this world. And the Christian Bible insists that it's only by embracing Jesus that a person can come out from under that control of Satan. Um, and we've seen in the past that this is just simply uh, uh, an erroneous belief. First of all, we've seen, um, and we're going to see in the future, but we've seen that Christians are not uh, free from the, the grip of Satan. 
Um, you know, there are many stories in the Christian Bible where Paul himself says that sa Satan prevented him from going to certain places. We know that Christians still, still sin. Um, and we, we know that the works of Satan have not been destroyed. Um, and furthermore, we've seen that one of the most important messages in the Tanakh, in the Torah, is where God, at the very beginning of the Bible, meaning that right after the Garden of Eden story, right after the sin of Adam and Eve, where a person may possibly entertain this idea that maybe after Adam and Eve sinned, that's the nature of humanity and that we have to sin and we don't have any more control. So immediately after this story, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, God says to Cain, listen, sin is always going to be at your door. You're always going to be tempted by sin. But God says, Va'atatim sholba, but you can rule over it. You have the ability to veto the wiles and the temptations of Satan and the temptation to sin. It's not something which controls you. God says you are in control of it. And throughout the Jewish Bible, throughout the Tanakh, this is a very, very critical idea, the idea of free will, that human beings have moral free will. Uh, we're not programmed like a computer to do the wrong thing automatically. God basically says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, I put before you life and death, blessing and curse. So you have the choice and God says, choose life. If you wanna be smart, God says, make the right choice and choose life, choose to obey me. So this is not something which is out of our control. If it was out of our control, God could not ask us to choose the right choice. Um, so this whole idea that human beings are controlled by Satan is just simply, not just nonsensical, but it's really anti-biblical. Um, going on in the chapter, um, this is, um, I'll point something out that we've again mentioned numerous times, but beginning with verse four, you see that Paul distinguishes once again between God and Jesus, right? Paul is not saying here that Jesus is God. Paul very clearly distinguishes between God and Jesus. So I'll read from verse four, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together with the Messiah, meaning God did something with the Messiah, with Jesus. Not that God is Jesus or that Jesus is God. It was God as opposed to distinguished from Jesus. And Paul goes on to say, by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with him, with, again, the Messiah, with Jesus, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in the Messiah, Jesus. So again, these are all things that God is doing in relationship with Jesus. And Paul makes that very clear distinction here that there is God and there is Jesus, and they are not equivalent. They're not the same being. Now, we move on in the chapter, and Paul has a very, very um, central teaching here. I think one of the things that really sort of um, drives him, he starts in verse eight, I believe, by saying, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, meaning that your salvation, your right situation with God is not as a result of what you have done. It is a gift of God. It's only because God has given this as a free gift. Paul says in verse nine, not a result of works, meaning your salvation, your right standing with God, has nothing to do with what you do, nothing to do with your behavior um, and how you live. And why is that, Paul says? Why is it that it has nothing to do with you and nothing to do with what you do? And only through God's grace and through God's free gift, so Paul says, so that no one may boast. That seems to be Paul's major concern, that if our salvation was dependent upon our behavior, our deeds, our works, Paul feels that that could lead to arrogance, to boasting, 
um, it's very fascinating that the Jewish theological position is one thousand percent opposite, meaning that we are completely on a different side of the page in terms of this question. Obviously, um, you know, if people feel that what they have is simply the result of their own efforts, that could lead to boasting, and that is inappropriate. But that's not a reason to basically dis, uh, take away the whole system of righteous deeds versus um, people who don't live righteously. And as the Bible often says, God will reward us according to our deeds. The fact that there's the potential for people to be arrogant, uh, that doesn't mean that we throw out the whole baby with the bathwater. Because even though there's a potential for arrogance, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone is going to boast and be arrogant um, because their good works has led to their right relationship and right standing with God. Um, you know, the, the Jewish theological position, as I mentioned, is 100 percent, 100, whatever percentage it is, totally in the opposite direction. Um, and this is the reason. God ultimately, uh, God's agenda, if you will, for human beings is that we have the opportunity and that we will experience the ultimate bliss of being in relationship with him, meaning that just as a parent, what a parent wants for their children is the children's ultimate pleasure and, maxim and, and maximizing the fulfillment and pleasure uh, in life that they can receive. No parent is going to be happy if their child only has 75% of the pleasure that they can experience in life. Any normal parent hopes and, and wishes and dreams their child will experience all of the pleasure that is potentially available in life. And that's God's agenda as well. Our sages teach us that the whole reason that God created us is that God, God wanted a vehicle upon which to bestow his goodness. And a, a vehicle, meaning human beings, would be uh, those beings who would receive the goodness of God. Now, what is the goodness of God? So it's true that God has created many pleasurable things in this world, but every pleasurable thing in the world, every ounce of beauty in the world, they all point back to God. God is the source of everything. And because God is the greatest that there is, the greatest being, the ultimate good, so the ultimate experience of pleasure and goodness is to experience God. And that's God's agenda. That's God's ultimate goal for humanity. And so you could ask a very simple question. If God's desire and, and agenda is for all human beings to experience him and to have the ultimate pleasure of that um, connection with God, that blissful connection to God, why did God send us into this physical material world where there are so many distractions and temptations that can lead us away from God? Why didn't God just stick everyone up in heaven, meaning create human beings and leave them in heaven? And in heaven, that's your default position. In heaven, you are just hanging out with God. That's all there is. Um, God could have done that. But Jewish theology says, that, no, that to get something like that, that you didn't earn and that you didn't work for and that you don't deserve is not really going to be pleasurable. Meaning if God's ultimate wish is that human beings experience maximal pleasure, we don't get pleasure out of getting something as a handout, out of getting, um, you know, because unfortunately, you know, you don't have anything, you've got to get, you know, charity or a charity case. You just don't have it on your own. You get a handout. The, the rabbis refer to this as Nahama de Chisufa, the bread of shame, that when you get something that you didn't work for, you don't feel good about it. And you only feel good when you've worked for it and you've struggled for it and you've earned it and you deserve it. And so when Paul says, 
that salvation can't be based upon your works because it would lead to boasting, Judaism says that your salvation, meaning we don't believe in the way salvation is explained by Christianity, but the idea of having a right relationship with God, that ultimate blissful experience, that has to be based upon our efforts and our works and our deeds and the way we live our life, because otherwise we're just getting it as a handout. And there it, it's embarrassing, it's shameful. We don't experience any joy when we don't work for it. And, and really when we don't work for something, it's just cheap in our eyes, but not just cheap. There's a sort of shame in getting something as a handout because it's saying to you, you can't do it. You don't have any ability and I have to do it for you. And the truth is that God has tremendous faith in human beings that we can do it. And, and that's why, um, you know, the Bible says that the commandments are not too far away from you. They're not up in the heaven that you can't do it. It's not beyond the sea that you can't do it. God says that the Torah, his commandments are very close to us in our hearts and in our, in our lips, our, our mouths that you can do it. That's what God says to us. We can do it. We have the ability. God says to Cain in Genesis 4, you can rule over the temptation to sin. And so um, there's here very, very different theological perspective on this idea of whether or not our right relationship with God should be based at all upon our own works. Now, Paul seems to say that... Um, you know, if it's based upon your efforts and your works, that will lead to boasting. What's fascinating is that in the Torah, uh, there is a discussion about the person in the Jewish world that's the most likely to be arrogant, the most likely to boast, and that would be the king. If anyone is someone that can feel proud and boastful, it would be the king. And what does God do to ensure that the king will not feel arrogance and boastful and pride. So God says in Deuteronomy chapter 17, the king has to write for himself two Torah scrolls. And so they will remind him to keep the commandments. And by keeping the commandments, it says there in chapter 17, verse 20, his heart will not be lifted up. So you see here that from God's point of view, as opposed to Paul, it's the works, it's the deeds, it's the keeping of the commandments that is the antidote to boasting and to arrogance. It doesn't lead to boasting and arrogance. Um, you know, the Bible always speaks about this danger. It says in Deuteronomy that a person might always say, Kochi yodi asu li chayel hazot, that it's my strength and my might that has gained me all of this wealth. So obviously, no person can ever believe or should ever believe that God doesn't play a part in granting them through God's love and grace and kindness and mercy, um, you know, help in earning our place in the world to come. It's not as if we do this on our own. Without God, we couldn't even take a breath. Without God, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't do any good works. So if a person actually does um, forget about God and think that everything you're doing is themselves, then that is an ugly kind of arrogance that will not you know, be looked upon favorably by God. But if a person legitimately is thankful to God for helping them use their minds properly and helping them to make the right moral choices and helping them to fulfill God's commandments and helping them to stay alive and be healthy. And the person acknowledges God's role and grace and mercy in their life. Um, it's that acknowledgement of God alongside the person's correct behavior and obedience to God and good works. That is precisely what will grant them a share in the world to come, meaning eternal bliss. Um, and so ultimately, because of the potential for boasting and arrogance, we don't upend, we don't do away with the appropriate system, which is that a person has to earn 
their share in the world to come. If we just got it as a free gift, then it would be meaningless and we'd feel ashamed of it. Um, now, verse 10, Paul goes back to something that he said last time we met. Paul writes, for we are his workmanship created in Jesus the Messiah for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, there are two things I wanted to say about this verse. Um, John MacArthur, in his commentary, says something that's pretty astounding. He says, a person's salvation and their good works were ordained before time began. Not only, as we saw last week, Paul writes about a person's salvation, whether they're going to be a believer or not, might already have been predetermined by God. Again, we saw that was a, a, in dispute among Christian thinkers, but MacArthur seems to be saying here that a person's salvation was already ordained before time began, but even their good works, meaning whether or not a person is going to live a good life and live a life that is um, noble and virtuous, that's something, again, that's out of their control. It's something that God already determined. Um, it seems that according to people like MacArthur, you, we're not even human beings. We're robots. And the only reason we do good is because we're programmed to do good. Um, our rabbis teach in the Talmud, Hakol bidei shamayim chutz miyirat shamayim, that everything is in the hands of God except for the fear of God, meaning everything in our life, how tall we're going to be, whether we're going to grow up in a family that's wealthy or poor, what country we're going to be born in, you know, what what time, what what you know, what age we're going to be born in, you know, all these questions about life um, are questions that are, according to the Talmud, already arranged by God. All of our circumstances in life, but whether or not we're going to be obedient to God, whether or not we're going to fear God, whether or not we're going to desire a relationship with God. God can't force a relationship upon us that's not meaningful. There's no relationship when it's forced upon you. So this idea that both our salvation and our good works were ordained before time began, that's sort of become, it, it's hard to even think about it. Um, the Apologetic Study Bible says that good works are the fruit born in the lives of those whom God has saved. And this is a very, very commonly held view in virtually all the Christian uh, commentaries that I've consulted. The Reformation Study Bible says something similarly. Good works are the vital consequence and evidence of life with God. So again, the, the Christian perspective here is that it's not that salvation comes as a result of a person's good works, but that Good works come as a result of a person's salvation, meaning if a person has been saved through their faith in Jesus' death as an atonement for their sins, as a result of that salvation, Paul believes that they'll be the fruit of that salvation, which will be evidenced by their good works. Um, the problem here is when you think about it, um, what about the good works of non-Christians, meaning that here you have the Reformation Study Bible saying that good works are the vital consequence and evidence, that good works are the evidence of life with God. So would that seem to mean that even non-Christians who have good works, that do good deeds, that are obedient to God, is that evidence of what? Does that mean that they have a relationship with God, even without believing in Jesus? That's hard to square that circle. And so, um, you know, it's one thing if Christians believe that, um, you know, spiritual Christians who have a relationship with God through Jesus, that will lead them to good works. That's not a, an objectionable idea to hear. But to say that, you know, there is no other way of having good works, and the only evidence of a person's um, ability to have good works and good deeds is if they were saved through believing in Jesus, that already becomes a very obnoxious doctrine and a very impossible one to square with the reality. Because again, 
we can just see by observation that there are righteous people that have good works, that live saintly lives in virtually every religion in the world, even among atheists. The fact that someone doesn't believe in God doesn't mean that they can't live a noble, virtuous life. Um, and as we know, just because someone is a godly person, meaning a person does believe in God, isn't a guarantee they're going to live a godly life. We know plenty of believing people from various religions that are miserable, obnoxious, horrible people. So this idea that there's an ex exclusivity to good works only among people who have been saved by believing in Jesus is, again, a, an obnoxious uh, and just erroneous uh, claim. Paul goes on to say, this is a major theme in the chapter now, um, that he says to the Ephesians in verse 11, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, meaning Jews who are referred to as those of the circumcision would refer to the Gentiles as those who are uncircumcised, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from the Messiah, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, the, <laughs> This is quite amazing. Paul is saying here that Gentiles, I guess prior to coming to faith in Jesus, but throughout history were people that have no hope and had no with, are without God. Um, you know, think about someone like Adam. Would you say that Adam was someone that had no hope and he had no God? I mean, clearly Adam uh, wasn't always obedient to God, but certainly Adam knew God and Adam had hope to have a relationship with God. Um, to say that people who were not Jewish, not members of the, you know, Israelite people before the coming of Jesus had no spiritual hope and were without God is just patently absurd. Um, we know that they were godly people Prior to Christianity, there was um, Hanoch, who I've mentioned before in the earliest generations. There was Seth. There was Shem. Uh, there was Ever. Um, we know about righteous Gentiles like Jethro and Ruth. Um, how could it, how could anyone say? How could Paul say here that they were without hope and without God in the world? And the truth is that, um, you know, God, even though these are people that weren't, as Paul says here, they weren't part of the commonwealth of Israel, but one of the major teachings of the Bible is that you don't have to be a Jew to have a relationship with God. If that were the case, God would have instructed the Jewish people, the Israelites, to go and convert everyone to Judaism. But that was never something that they were commanded to do. And as a matter of fact, we see in the book of Ruth that when Ruth wanted to join Naomi and join the Jewish people, Naomi doesn't say that's great because otherwise you're doomed to have no relationship with God. She says, just go back to your own family. Go back to Moab. You don't need to join me and come to Israel. But Ruth persists. And even though Naomi basically tries to deter her several times, Ruth still says, look, your God is my God and your people are my people. Where you die, I'll, I'll die. And so finally, we know that Ruth converts to Judaism. But had there been this biblical idea that non-Jews could never have any kind of spiritual hope, her mother-in-law would have encouraged her to embrace Judaism and to come back to Israel with her. So this idea that there is no hope for Gentiles and no God for Gentiles without coming to Jesus is just absurd. There's, again, nothing in the Bible that gives that impression whatsoever. And furthermore, if what Paul is saying here is that the Gentiles had no hope and no God without Christianity, without believing in Jesus, does that imply that the Jews did have hope in God and did have God without believing in the Messiah, without believing in Jesus? I mean, I mentioned this before. 
you had countless generations of righteous, pious, godly Jewish men and women who didn't know anything about Jesus, and yet they had an intimate, close relationship with God. And so th this whole chapter, again, as I said, wanted to, m wanted to make me pull my hair out of my head with the few hairs that I have. Um, uh, it's in verse 13, again, um, Paul says, but now in the Messiah Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. And so the NLT, the New Living Translation Study Bible says, only by being united with the Messiah through trust in him can a person be reconciled to God. Again, how does a person even suggest such an idea that it's impossible to have a connection with God without faith in Jesus? Again, it's absurd because we saw that in the Tanakh, way before Jesus was even a glimmer in his father's eye, um, there were righteous, godly people, um, you know, who knew God, who walked with God, had a relationship with God, and lived righteous lives. Um, so it's just very, very difficult to understand um, really what's going on here. Um, now we're going to another important, important discussion that Paul begins in verse 14. Paul says about Jesus that he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, both meaning the, us, the Jews, and they, the Gentiles, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Let's discuss this very, very uh, controversial and I think from a Christian point of view, important passage. Um, what is this idea of one new man? So the ESV study Bible says the Messiah makes peace between the Jew and the Gentile to unify both in the church. There is only one united people of God. Um, and the ESV study Bible goes on to say that this idea of a new man is denoting a new human race under the second Adam, which is Jesus, in whose image the Christian is recreated. So it seems to me that one of the effects of this kind of theology is basically, in effect, a form of replacement theology. Um, meaning that non-believing Jews, Jews that are not Messianic Jews, don't have any part now in God's people. Um, again, it's saying that with the advent of Christianity, um, there's a unification of Jews who believe in Jesus and Gentiles who believe in Jesus, and they have become the united people of God, not the people of Israel really anymore. For the most part, the people of Israel never signed on to this idea. And so, again, in effect, what this doctrine of one new man is saying is that there's been a replacement theology, and Israel, the, the initial people of God, basically are irrelevant. And the only people who are the people of God are Jewish and Gentile believers in Jesus. And again, over the past 2,000 years, the number of Jewish people in that mixture has been almost infinitesimally small. Um, and again, another problem here is that there is absolutely zero hinting at this in the Tanakh. The Tanakh never speaks about the idea that with the advent of the Messiah, um, Jews and Gentiles who believe in the Messiah are going to be united as one people. What the Tanakh does speak about importantly, many, many times explicitly and unambiguously, is with the advent of the Messiah, there's going to be a reunification of the kingdom of Judah, which are basically the Jews remaining uh, since the exile of the ten northern tribes, and the kingdom of Israel, the ten so-called lost tribes of Israel. This is something which the Bible says 
over and over and over again in Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and many other places, that's one thing that's going to be reunified. They're going to be a reunification of the people of Israel, the full uh, complement of the 12 tribes. But you won't find anything anywhere in the Tanakh which says that somehow with the coming of the Messiah, uh, you know, the vast majority of the, of the children of Abraham are going to be kicked to the gutter and there's going to be a new people of God that's constituted by the believers of the Messiah, both Gentile and Jewish. Um, it's important to remember that the promise that God made to Abraham and repeatedly made to the people of Israel was that they are going to be an eternal people. And that, as an example in Genesis 17, that circumcision is going to be an eternal sign. Circumcision of the flesh is going to be an eternal sign of this people of God. And so this idea of one new man, which basically kicks out the vast majority of Jewish people, is, again, it's, a, it's, it's an absurd doctrine, and it's anti-biblical. Now, Paul speaks about that what Jesus is going to do is to abolish the... Um, what he calls a dividing wall of hostility. And he refers to what is the dividing wall of hostility? It's the Torah. Again, Paul says here that the Messiah has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Now, th this idea that the Torah, the commandments of God, are a wall of hostility, a dividing wall of hostility, most of the Christian commentaries say that the imagery here is going to the temple courtyard. That uh, here, for example, the ESV study Bible says, there was an inscription on the wall of the outer courtyard of the Jerusalem temple warning Gentiles that they would only have themselves to blame for their death if they passed beyond into the inner courts. Um, it's interesting that many Christian commentaries speak about a dividing wall between the Gentile court and the Israelite court. There was no Gentile court on the Temple Mount. Um, there was basically, uh, you know, the public area, um, which, you know, led up to the outer precincts of the Temple Mount, of the Temple precinct, but there was no specifically Gentile court. Um, and again, this idea that there was a wall in the temple separating Jews from non-Jews um, actually is really half of a truth. Um, there wasn't simply a wall dividing Jews from non-Jews. Um, there was a fence. It was a short fence uh, that surrounded the area of the Temple Mount called the Soreg. You can, in English, you would spell it S-O-R-E-G. And this was a fence that didn't only um, warn non-Jews to not go past it, but it also kept out Jews who were Tamei, who were ritually impure. So this idea that there was this great hostility between Jews and Gentiles, and it was symbolized by this wall, is really absurd, because the wall was not only uh, a demarcation between Jews and Gentiles, it was between anyone who should not be going into the temple precinct, the temple area, which would have been uh, non-Jews, it wasn't their temple, and Jews who were ritually impure. Um, it's important to remember that Gentiles were allowed to send sacrifices to be offered in the temple. It's not as if the Gentiles had no connection to the temple, but they weren't supposed to go into certain areas. And that's true, by the way, not just of non-Jews, it's true for Jews as well. No Jew was allowed to go into the area that was reserved for the Kohanim, the priests, for example. So this, you know, it's a very uh, uh, 
like flammable kind of idea that there was this horrible barrier that kept out the Gentiles. It's it's sort of it's not really being truthful. Um, that barrier they're referring to kept out not just Gentiles but certain Jews, and there were similar barriers that divided the camp of the Israelites from the priests. And no one would have characterized that distinction that um, there was a barrier, actually, um, as a uh, as a dividing wall of hostility between Israelites and priests. No one would have said something so ridiculous. It's, there's, nothing, there's no hostility that's implied. There are laws of the Temple Mount that God set up where only priests had access to certain parts and only Jews who were ritually pure had access to other parts and where Gentiles could stay outside the that area, which was accessible to all ritually pure Jews. But it was never seen as a wall of hostility. Now, what's interesting is that Paul describes the real wall of hostility, not as that wall in the temple. He's comparing that really. That's a that's a image. Uh, the real wall of hostility, according to Paul, is the Torah or the commandments. The Zondervan study Bible says the following. The Messiah sets aside the old covenant with its Mosaic law and replaces it with a new covenant for all believers, Jew and Gentile. Consequently, the Mosaic law cannot serve as a barrier between Jewish and Gentile believers, meaning that since the Mosaic law will be done away with, it's not going to exist anymore, that wall is going to be torn down. So now there's no more distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Um, this, again, flies in the face of Tanakh, of the scriptures. Um, this appeal to the idea of a new covenant just fails on so many levels. First of all, the new covenant um, did not abolish the law, meaning when Jeremiah in chapter 31 speaks about there's going to be a new covenant that's made, it doesn't say there at, or even imply that the observance of the commandments will no longer be in effect. Um, <laughs> it actually says the exact opposite. Um, the, the passage there in Jeremiah says that God's going to place the Torah into our hearts. Now, having a Torah in our hearts does not mean that we're no longer going to observe it. It means the exact opposite throughout the Bible. In Psalms, David says, I desire to do your commandments, God, because your law is within my heart. And Ezekiel chapter 11, Ezekiel chapter 36 speaks about this idea of God basically renewing our hearts and taking out the heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh that Ezekiel says, and we will keep the commandments. So the idea that there's going to be a new Torah where God, a new covenant, a new relationship where God places the Torah within our hearts not saying that when it's in our heart, we're not going to keep it. On the contrary, having it in our heart means that we're going to be faithful to keeping it. Secondly, the new covenant that Jeremiah speaks about, completely as opposed to what Paul says, that new covenant was not including Gentiles. If you study Jeremiah 31, it says it was a covenant that God's going to make with Judah and with Israel. It mentions nothing about non-Jews, because again, non-Jews were not given the 613 commandments to observe. And finally, it's very clear from reading that passage in Jeremiah that this new covenant has not been made yet, because what Jeremiah says there is that once the new covenant is made, there will never be a need to teach people to believe in God, because they will all believe in me, Jeremiah says, from the least of them to the greatest of them. And this is one of the major themes of the messianic age, that all human beings, all flesh will come to know God. As Zechariah says in chapter 14, verse 9, and that day God will be one and his name will be one. And so this hasn't happened yet. We don't live in a world where everyone believes in God. And so the, the Zondervan study Bible trying to invoke Jeremiah 31, the new covenant, just falls flat on its face. John MacArthur, when he speaks about abolishing the law of commandments, says the following. Again, you'll see why I wanted to pull my hair out of my head. John MacArthur says in his commentary, through his death, 
the Messiah abolished the Old Testament ceremonial laws, feasts, and sacrifices, right, wow. which uniquely separated Jews from Gentiles. God's moral law, his moral law, as contained in the Ten Commandments, was not abolished. Now, where does the Tanakh ever say that the ceremonial laws of the Bible are going to be abolished when the Messiah comes? Where does the Tanakh ever speak ever about the ceremonial laws, the ritual laws ever being abolished? The truth is that when we study the Tanakh, God says repeatedly, so many times, that the laws and commandments he's giving, and he specifies many times ritual laws. For example, like in Leviticus, the consumption of forbidden fats. God says this is an eternal law throughout your generations. So God specifically says that the commandments, all of the commandments, are t given to the Jewish people, given to Israel eternally, God says forever, throughout your generations. There's nothing where it ever says that it's going to have a limited shelf life, and when the Messiah comes, uh, basically you toss them out of the supermarket. The Bible never says that. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the exact opposite. When the Messiah comes, that's specifically when Israel is going to be Torah observant. Through most of Jewish history, all of Israel did not observe the Torah. And yet we see that one of the conditions for the Messiah to come, we see this in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and Isaiah chapter 59, is that Israel has to turn back to God and observe the Torah. And we find in Ezekiel chapter 37, when Ezekiel describes the best description in the Bible of the Messiah, he speaks about the universal observance of the Torah by the Jewish people. Um, we see that the sacrifices are not going to be annulled when the Messiah comes. As a matter of fact, you have chapters and chapters and chapters in the book of Ezekiel describing exactly what the temple is going to look like, the third temple, which will be built when the Messiah comes, and the restoration of sacrifices. So this <laughs> commentary by John MacArthur, I would like to sit down and have uh, you know, a meal with him and ask him not just those questions, but <laughs> how does he say that the ritual commandments were abolished except the Ten Commandments were not abolished? Um, if he doesn't remember, the Ten Commandments includes the Sabbath, which is not a moral law. The Sabbath is one of the feast days. It's one of the um, you know appointed times. It's a, it's a ritual law. It's a law that's ceremonial. And so this idea that the Ten Commandments are just moral laws is, again, just, you know, it's, it's first grade Bible. Um, okay. So I think that more or less covers the major points in Ephesians chapter two. I'm going to have to go and get a hair transplant this week. And, uh... <laughs> after, pulling, after pulling all your hair out, yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man, definitely a lot to consider for sure. Man, I'll tell you what, it's like one continuous struggle after another just to try to get, um, you, you need to have like a New Testament needs to come with a bottle, its own bottle of water so you can wash it down when you're done. It comes in pretty hard for sure. Rabbi, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it, and I know we all do. Uh, so Hashem willing, we'll see you uh, back here again, same time, same place um, next week. So you guys have a great Same bath time. Same bat time, same bat station. There you go. Look for the bat signal in the sky. <laughs> I'll see you guys. Take care, Rabbi. Love Have you guys. Hey, you too. See, see you. See everybody. Peace. Shalom, shalom.
חשוב והכרחי להיות ביחד, איפוק זו העוצמה.